My name's Galen Beery, and I've been asked to explain a little bit about what I was doing with the Hmong over 40 years ago. I would take a camera out, and I shot many, many pictures. It was not like today. You couldn't just show them a picture immediately. You had to go down and have the picture done in Vientiane and bring the pictures up and hand it to them. And I didn't realize then that I was recording the history of the Hmong people for the years that I was there. The Hmong lived in very high places on very isolated hills. One of the problems is while you can build a village by bringing bamboo and other things up and putting a ring of trenches around to defend yourself from, the ground is not particularly good. You slash, burn the trees, you plant the rice, and burn the rubbish that is cut. And you can get one, two, maybe three harvests of the hill rice, but after that, you have to move on. The villages were quite isolated, but with the airline, basically, that we had flying back and forth and two and three days marches, you would be able to begin connecting with other Hmong in this giant network of a Hmong nation. When they arrived in Samtong for medical treatment, and were ready to go, they would often just go to the airport. And the rationale made sense. Why should I walk three days back to my village when, if I wait here long enough, a plane will just pick us up and take us back to where we were. But the Hmong preferred the independence, the rough way of living. Yet they had to fight and protect their homes and they kept losing and kept moving southwards through the mountains. There was a lot of fighting, there was a lot of running, there was a lot of shooting, and there was a lot of dying. And I never learned the name of more than one or two airplane pilots because they had quite a high mortality rate. We had two groups that we flew in, primarily Air America, the other was uh, known as Continental Airlines, and they worked for the boys next door. We delivered rice for the two years that I worked with Pop, helping people go to a new area and uh, get started in a new life. There was quite a lot of attrition among the Hmong soldiers. It got so bad that at one time, General Vong Pao had to send out the order that all students, male, up to the age uh, of 11, were uh, exempt from going in the army. But if you were 11 years old, you were drafted, and you ended up in the Hmong army. I went out to the airstrip one day and saw a group of soldiers around a body. It was a very small body talked to a little boy next to it. He was 12 years old, and he was dressed in a uniform that was about three times too big. He was Hmong, but he knew Lao. And he said, that is my friend, Li Gao. He and I both joined the army a year ago when he was 10 and I was 11. And he was killed this week, and I am flying back with his body to the village that he came with. His rifle accompanied him, a small carbine suitable for that of a boy. The larger rifles went to uh, taller, more grown-up men. But a helicopter or a plane picked up the body and they picked up the gun, flew them back to the village. He was buried and his carbine was then handed to the next boy that took his place in the Hmong army. I had an assistant, Lee Sang, and I said, Lee Sang, I have a camera here. Why don't you take some pictures? And I showed him how to operate it. And several days later, came back, and Lee Sang had taken a roll of pictures, and I took them down and had them printed. 
one picture, I said, what is this? This is quite unusual, tell me. And it's the picture you're looking at here. He told me that there had been attack on the airfield the night before, and he'd heard people running. And the next morning after everything was under control, he went out to the airfield and just to the edge of the airfield found a woman who had been sick and come to Bonson to have treatment. She and her husband and child had gone out to the airport and when the shooting started, they picked up everything and ran and her husband and her child had been hit and killed. The next morning they were sitting at the airport. She had a blanket over the bodies and she realized that she needed some money to buy something to eat for breakfast and she reached down and she pulled the blanket from her husband and child, took some money out of his pocket and then began to realize again that she had lost her husband and child in this long seemingly never ended war and began to cry. One of the reporters asked me one day, uh, you keep talking about refugees and we think they're all soldiers. And I said, they are soldiers. And he said, how can you be a refugee and a soldier at the same time? And I pointed to one of the Hmong nearby and said, I know him quite well. He has been fighting ever since he was born because he had to move when he was a boy and then he moved as a young man and a married man. And he has been a refugee eight times. Now he is also carrying a gun because when the enemy comes in one side of the village fighting a, firing a gun, you usually like to have a gun to shoot back as you grab the wife and the children and your items of uh, possessions, your baskets and the pigs and the chickens, you like to have them and you flee south, but you also try and defend yourself as a member of the army. So tell me, is he a refugee or a soldier? And I say he's both. One man that I had pointed it to him to had been a refugee eight times. And here he was, he helped me work with the uh, people who were selling rice to us to give to the new refugees that came down. And while we were sitting, waiting for a helicopter to come back to pick up some of this rice, he said, you know, you're going home on vacation, but we keep fleeing downwards and I can't go anywhere except south. And we're running out of mountains. I went on vacation in the United States and I came back and a month later attended his funeral services. He had been on a, a small aircraft that was flying north. It hit an air pocket. It flipped over and it killed everyone on the airplane and he became just another statistic in the Hmong who have been killed fighting for their lives and for their country. I will be sending a contribution to a memorial in his name, a memorial up on the shores of Lake Michigan in a town called Sheboygan. His name is Nautu Lo Sai Chu, and his name will be on the memorial. But the story I remember most intimately and says a lot for America was a young couple that came up. They spoke no English, they spoke Lao and Hmong. And it was a young boy and his wife. He was probably 20, she was probably about 19. And you looked at them and you knew from their clothes that they did not have very much. And the customs official says, what do you got in the bag? 
and they pulled open the bag. And in the bag was a little pot with a lid, two spoons, a few pieces of clothing, and a toothbrush. And the man said, whose toothbrush? And they both grabbed the toothbrush together, holding it between them and looking at us. And the man said, how much money do you have? And the husband looked in his pocket and he brought out the equivalent of about $3.81. Okay, said the customs official, you can go on. And they walked down through the door that led them to America. And he turned to me and he had tears in his eyes and he said, when I see people like that, I wonder how they can ever make it in the United States. They're poor, they don't have anything. And then I think my grandfather and grandmother, they came from the old country and they didn't have anything either. And I know at that point that they can make it in the United States just like my grandparents did. It's a long and very uncomfortable history. The plight of the Hmong shows how much people will resist oppression. And I can only rejoice in that so many of them were able to do so and come to the United States.